Welcome, everybody, to episode number four of Top Soccer Coach. Today, we have Dean Kosky, the head coach of Lehigh Men's Soccer Program. Dean has been at this for a very long time. He's one of the top coaches in the NCAA. Dean has multiple Patriot League titles, multiple NCAA appearances with his team, produced a ton of All-Americans. And I know firsthand, I know the good work that Dean does because I've been fortunate to spend maybe a couple days every summer with Dean for the last, I don't know, eight or nine years until we stopped doing the EDP camp together. But um, I've got some really valuable insight from working with Dean for those summers. And also, I've had the opportunity to watch him coach a little bit, even though he probably doesn't know. But now every time games are on ESPN and all this, I, I always tune in, especially if I know it's one of my friends who's coaching. So everybody, welcome, uh, Dean Kosky. Dean, great to have you on the show. Thanks for so much for spending your time with us here today. Marcus, I'm thrilled to be here with you, and thanks for asking me. No worries. So, Dean, first question to put you on the hot seat here: the how important um, is building a culture at, at Lehigh for you? Like, do, how do you build the culture that you want on your team? I think without without the right culture. Um, it's very hard to win at the collegiate level because these young student athletes, 18 to 22 year olds are living with one another, going to classes with one another, um, training with one another, getting on buses with one another, tra like traveling with one another. And if, if they don't know one another and they don't respect one another and they don't like one another, um, it, it makes it really difficult for that to translate out onto the field and have success. And my experiences over the 30 years at Lehigh is that when I've had really successful teams, the culture has been really strong and the relationships have been really strong. Um, and when I haven't had successful seasons, the, the culture has been disparate and the culture has struggled. And and not because there are are bad apples, it's because we haven't taken the time to, to build the relationships and get in, taking time for players to get to know one another. And and you have to invest in that. You have to invest it away from soccer, away from the soccer ball, away from practices. You have to invest in in, in ways to make sure that they get to know one another. So, Dean, so you're, you have some core values then that you want in your culture, and then you have some core values in the way that you're, you, you play your soccer, right? How do you teach those on a, like reinforce and teach those on a daily basis? I think you ha it's sort of repetition, you know, messaging. I think the messaging has to be consistent. The repetition has to to support those core values. And so, let's say work ethic is one of our core values. Um, sure. And 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 guys show up to practice, and they're not working hard in practice. If you allow that to continue, um, that's going to become <laughs> unwittingly or not is going to be part of the, the playing style, the mentality, and the culture on the team. And and so you have to nip that in the bud right away, that you have to explain to them what work ethic looks like in a training session. How do you how do you go through a, a passing exercise or a rondo exercise at, at the level that you need to go through? And 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 they have to understand that that there's there's a time to 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 take your foot off the gas, but but for the most part your your work ethic, there's no there's no compromise with that. Like that's the one thing they can control is a work ethic. And so I do think that that if you continue to preach that and show them that and help them understand that every day, and that includes what they do off the field and you know their their school, then I think they begin to, that resonates with them. But it doesn't happen overnight. That that's a constant messaging. Yeah, yeah, Dean. W w I see that you schedule like you don't back down from anybody. So you're playing the pits, you're playing the Marylands, and all these. And obviously, when you make the tournament, you also draw some really hard competition normally, right? So, yes. but I noticed that like your non-conference games, sometimes you're picking the big boys to play. How come? Well, one, one is that in, in order for us to aspire to be a top 40 program, you know, with with the kind of school that we are and, 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 and be mindful of the fact that we are a, a very academic school, it's hard to get in here. We're not fully funded. And so we want to make sure that that in order for us to aspire to that level of of ranking, if you will, we need to measure ourselves against the best teams. We need to play the best teams. Uh, it also helps your RPI when you're playing the best teams. 
and and that matters you know if if you don't qualify for the NCAA tournament as an AQ an automatic qualifier in our conference uh, you want to give yourself the best shot of getting in as an <laughs> as an at large but I like I I, I want to play the best teams in the country and and I want players who look at our schedule prospects who look at our schedule and say wow the Patriot League is a good conference and a competitive conference, but wow, they, they go out and they play Northwestern and Maryland and West Virginia and Pitt. And we played Stanford and, you know, we will play anybody and everybody uh, if they want to play us because one, we believe we can compete with anybody and we have, we've shown that consistently, but uh, I also want to challenge, you know, our players and certainly challenge our coaching staff to, to try to compete against the best because if we are fortunate enough to get into the NCAA tournament, we got to be familiar with the level that we're playing against. And the only way you can be familiar with them is to play them during the season. Yeah. And so are you adjusting the way that you play when you go into these, to the big teams? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. certainly. I mean, I mean, we, if, if, if we like to press teams um, in our conference and with mm -hmm. all due respect, I've been in conference, we have some good teams in our conference and Loyola who won, you know, the, the Patriot League championship this year, um, certainly, will do well, I believe, in the NCAA tournament because they're, they're a good playing soccer team. But we might think twice about pressing Pitt at Pitt on the road on yes. a really big field <laughs> and a place that we're not really familiar with. And and yeah. so so I think that you, you have to pick and choose your your opponents and your moments to do that. But I think, you know, we'd probably be better suited in a neutral block or a low block when we play teams that we know that, look, every guy on Pitt's team is aspiring to be a pro. Every guy yeah. on that team, yeah. one or two guys in my in my program are aspiring to be a pro, and so yeah. there's a, certainly a difference in in the playing ability. But yeah, we can still go at Pitt, not have our best game, and walk off the field with a two one loss. And while we never feel good about a loss, we know that we can compete. Yeah, and as a coach, you think that's made you better in the process playing those teams? Certainly for me, because I learned things. Um, that I may not have thought about. Uh, I certainly will look at and study teams that are better than us historically, and teams, coaches that I, I look up to and admire, and 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 try to see what they do, and everything from how they warm up, everything from how they play, what their tactics look like, you know, the player selection, you know, why did they pick that player and put him in that position? So uh, I've learned a lot from playing <laughs> Georgetown yeah. and Stanford and in Northwestern and Pitt and uh, West Virginia. Look, the, the list goes on, but I've learned a ton just playing against those teams and playing against some of the best coaches in, in our country. So that's awesome. So D, I told you, like, I mean, a couple of years ago, I watched you against St. John's and you guys beat St. John's. And I consider St. John's, you know, any given year, one of the best programs in the country as well. And here you are sitting in your chair and commas could be, you know, orchestrating your team. They're carrying, I mean, it was, it was great. And I say to myself, I know that Dean is a super intense guy. I know that you want to win. I know that you have a ton of passion, but at the same time, you're still under control on that sideline. I was like, this is really great because you're able not to get caught up in the emotions and, and you're able to be constructive there. And it really, you were analyzing the game a lot. When you first got into coaching, maybe your first two years, were you the same way or did you mature into this? No, <laughs> I matured into it. I was coaching JV soccer uh, at a Quaker school, more coaching gig. And, mm -hmm. and I was a lunatic on the side <laughs> uh, because I thought I knew more than, than the referees. And I thought I knew more than everybody else. And, and I remember calling the referee a jerk uh, for not making a call right like and so I have evolved and and that you know that was I was 20 23 24 and I didn't know anything about self-control and I, I coached like I was a player and I was an intense player and a vocal player and a competitive player and it probably took me the better part of a decade to realize that I need to stop coaching like a player and start coaching like a coach and a mentor and settle down but it had it didn't happen overnight um, and the advice I have for any any young coach, aspiring coaches, don't make it about yourself. Don't make it about the referees. <laughs> just just go out and 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 coach in practice and in games. Try to let the players play. You can orchestrate a little bit, but don't be a joystick coach. Don't through every pass and every moment. Um, try to sit and analyze the game and analyze the, the, your opponent. Um, and let the players play because uh, every study will tell you, particularly with this generation of, of student athletes, that 
constructive criticism or a AI criticism or IE criticism doesn't really really work well with this generation of kids. You have to find other ways to communicate with them. And 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 to 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 the point of just saying, you know, when you pull a kid off, you know, rather than tell tell them all the things they did wrong because their def, their defenses are going to go up and they're not going to hear you. What I the first question I asked them is, what are you seeing out there? You know, uh, mm-hmm. because then it gives them a chance to talk and process with you. And the second question I ask, how can I help you? Um, and where do you need help? And now you become an ally in that and you become somebody that they're going to be like, OK, he wants to help me rather than tell them all the things they did wrong, because that's just not going to help them. And look, mind you, that doesn't always happen. There's sometimes I get pretty frustrated with the player. You now, we had a player uh, a- a- against Colgate with 17 seconds left on the clock. We were winning one nothing is center back ran 40 yards across midfield to pressure one of their backs who was dribbling towards her goal, his goal, grabbed his shirt and that, while they were before they're pressing him. And I, I lost my mind. I'm like, what are you thinking? So now they set up a dead ball. He gets the yellow card because he pulled his shirt down and they're ha- humping a ball into our box with 17 seconds left when the game was done. And yeah. so there, there certainly is a moment that, that I, I was, probably lost a little bit of my self-control because I was, he was right in front of me and I was really hard on him, but that's a moment that, that we can't, we can't allow our players to say that's okay. That's not okay. Because we want a Patriot League championship. My first one at, yep. at Lafayette, when they fouled us with eight seconds, they were winning one, nothing. They fouled us with eight seconds left in the game. And then a guy encroached and and then we put everybody in the box we score with eight seconds left we tied up and then we went on penalty kicks all because a guy stopped the clock and my messaging to my team is don't ever stop the clock when you're winning in the last couple of minutes of the game yeah 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 yeah. it's it's so interesting when i was a lunatic too dean when i first started coaching and you know i think the biggest lesson i ever learned when i was so intense i was coaching a team in the bronx and one of my players just couldn't handle that intensity and he headbutted the referee because of a bad call and the cops were called and the kid was going to get arrested. And, and luckily, you know, it's New York city. So the cops never showed up <laughs> and then the ref just went home because he got tired of waiting. Right. But my message to my, you know, it made me rethink the way I was coaching. I was like, you know what? Emotionally, not every kid is ready for this super high intensity version of me. And what purpose did it really serve? Like I, I blame myself almost for getting that kid in that situation where he wanted to win so bad that he just snapped. So it, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting over the years. Yeah. Um, yeah Marcus, Marcus, let me interrupt. I remember you coaching a team at DDP camp uh, and, and you were appropriate, but your intensity was, was exciting. Um, you know, in, in with these kids that you just, but I could tell that, man, you really wanted, them to understand and to compete and to win. Um, and it made me pause in a good way because I thought, you know, here are these kids that are coming into camp who don't know you, but the fact that you were so emotionally invested in, in, in them understanding the importance of competing and what to do. I remember thinking, wow, he's really intense. And I was like, wow, he's really coaching these kids. And it's finding that balance, right? It's all about finding the balance yeah. of being emotional and letting them know that you care, but not, not beating on them. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm always going to be that passionate, emotional guy, and I can't ever get rid of that, but I got to make sure that it's never personal and it's never going to get, you know, cause anything else. Yeah. It, yeah, It's fun. It's, it's, you know, some of my time in New York City as a teacher, you know, showed me some of the best teachers. They had this alter personality they went into when they went into the classroom. And yeah. It, yeah. It, was, it was interesting, and I almost kind of think that's, you know, that's kind of cool on the field as well. And I don't know. I, I, I You know what? It, there's so much fun experience seeing other coaches coach because uh, Pilger from Trinity, I really enjoyed some of his stories. He'd tell the kids and they were so into it. It's like we all take this little piece of knowledge that we have and try to give it to the kids. You know, it's it's because I remember being at soccer camp as a kid, too. Right. And, you know, all, all the all the great instructors and stuff. Dean, let me ask you about about the season. So when you're going into your season, do you have, I mean, your kids are there for four years, but I don't know what kind of turnover you have. Do you have like, this is what I'm doing in preseason. Here's the game model. Here's what we're going to work on roughly in September, October, November. Like, do you have all that pretty much planned out? 
what's your focus or do you have a good deal of flexibility that you can um operate under and step two to that question is after the season's done do you take a different approach to the team maybe more geared towards individual or player development compared to the season like what how do you do it at lehigh certainly we we want to have a plan going into our season and so we try to meet as a coaching staff as soon as the spring semester is over we'll, we will do a retreat roughly may june a two-day retreat somewhere we invited you to participate in one of our retreats and, and educate us and and we'll go somewhere and and all we will do is talk about the team uh talk about our, our game model talk about our players talk about our philosophy um do we need to make paradigm shifts and how we're teaching coaching and then from there we we develop a plan for the fall what we want to focus on in preseason who we think our projected key players are going to be our leaders going to be what, what freshmen that that we anticipate coming in and making an impact uh, and so that once we lay out that entire season and we will lay out all of our preseason practices and what we want to do in those preseason practices, we will lay out our calendar for the fall so that we know what our days off are, what our travel days are, you know, what our recovery days are, what are the medium days, hard days, light days, and so mm -hmm. forth. So if we can do that in June, now we're not scrambling, you know, August, the first first week in August, like, oh, my gosh, the team's going to be here. And what are we going to do? We, we try to do as much of that work ahead of time. And it, look, it takes two days of, of interaction and, and, you know, with a whiteboard and video and you name it. But I love it because it's 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 invigorating for me to to have these kinds of discussions with my staff and, and invite other people to be a part of that. But once we hit preseason and, and Marcus, you probably know this as well as I do is that you don't want to box yourself into a corner in terms of how you want to do things because there's so much that can change a, a key injury to a player over the summer that you had counted on right um, I told you prior to getting on the podcast is that we you know we had a player that that didn't get back from Senegal until 10 days in the preseason a key player for us a center back for us and so we had to be flexible and we had to tr look at other other people in that position and maybe play a different way and with a different system. So you could, you could have your game model and you could talk about what you think your formation is going to be, or you hope what your formation is going to be. But, but once preseason hits and you look at what you have, you better be willing to adapt. And I think the most successful coaches and the most successful players are adaptive in the moment are adaptive because whether the, the environment is bad, rainy day, whether there's an injury that you don't anticipate, you name it, you have to adapt. And so I don't, while I want to be planned out and I want to really have the, the macro um, uh, um, plan in place, I think for the micro stuff, you have to be really flexible and you have to be willing to adapt. And the second part of that question is at the end of the season, we go through a, a pretty um, um, thorough program evaluation. I do it with my coaching staff. I have individual meetings with all my players. Uh, and and then I meet with people in the administrative staff. We have a high performance team and that's mm -hmm. comprised of my direct report, our strength and conditioning coach, um, our leadership uh, director, um, and, and one or two other people that will be in there that aren't in there to evaluate me, but it's to say, Hey, what do you, what do you need from us? Like what, what, mm. what, how can we help you? And what do you see as your, you know, it's like a SWOT analysis, you know, what are your strengths, weaknesses and opportunities and, and how can we take advantage of that? So it's a really good processing mm. uh, opportunity for me. And then I sit in front of my administrative team and I write up a 10 page program review of everything about our program from, from our players to recruiting, to, to our facilities, to our game day management, to sports medicine, you name it, any area that's a sports staff that I'm giving them feedback on. You know, this is where I think we did well. This is what we can do better. Uh, even even sports information. And that mm -hmm. is a two hour meeting with, with my administrative team, um, which I find invaluable because it isn't a, hey, you didn't do this well, you didn't do that well. It is, what do you think about your program and how 
how can we help you and and what investments need to be made and how are we going to make those investments is it does it going to cost anything is it is it you know a, a non cost and like those things are really that's a really important exercise to go through so by the time i hit december i've gone through all that debriefing and all those meetings and and player meetings and and i'm able to go into the holiday season really with with a pretty open mind to about what we want to focus on in the spring, the winter and the spring with the team. And and I feel like we're all on the same page with that. So it's a, it's a really thorough process that, that I really appreciate. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. And how about, so how about the spring season? Do you, do you treat that a little differently than the fall season? hundred percent. It's developmental for us. So everything that we do from the minute they come really from the minute they leave campus for the winter break, they, they're on a strength and conditioning program, mostly strength training that, there's by our strength and conditioning staff that that's a take home that the guys have to do and just to make sure that they're maintaining and then they come back they get tested uh, to see where they are and then our strength and conditioning staff has them three days a week so that that piece of development the physical piece of development is really important particularly for freshmen and sophomores who still need are putting on some muscle mass and Mm -hmm. um and so three days a week with with them uh with our strength and conditioning staff they're one day a week with us based on NCA rules, how many hours we can have. And usually that's a training session uh, in the evenings out in the cold on turf. You know what it's like to be in the Northeast mm-hmm. or in the winter. Mm-hmm. And then they're playing pickup. We want them to do pickup soccer um, uh, as much as they can indoors. Uh, and usually that's led by the captains. And that usually runs for about the first month. And then once we're into a, a full eight to 10 hours, then we are training two, three times a week outside at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so doing their strength or their, their lifting with our strength and conditioning staff three days a week. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might pick up one day a week, but I like them to cross train. I like them to do other activities, pick up basketball, yeah. squash, whatever. I think that's really important for them uh, to do that. And then once we get in our spring season, we play six games. It's, it's purely developmental. It's all getting everybody a chance to play, uh, seeing where everybody is, including a lot of the guys who didn't play in the fall, like freshmen who aren't playing. We need to play them a lot to see how they've developed and where they are. So it gives us a pretty good snapshot of what we can anticipate going into the fall with our returning group. We certainly don't know what freshmen are bringing, but we have a pretty good idea by the end of spring, you know, what guys are ready to step in and play. Um, and and so I see that that spring semester, we call it our non-traditional segment as completely developmental yeah. uh, for them and the coaches. In fact, when I was a head coach doing all the coaching tactics and, and technical work uh, during the spring, I, I, my assistant coach or associate head coach did all the coaching in the spring. I wanted him to get the repetition, mm-hmm. him to get the experience of being in charge and running practices and making decisions about lineup. So I became the assistant coach in the spring as well. Uh, that's that that is awesome. I find Dean the, you know, as time goes on, the more flexible I'm becoming, as far as training sessions and really sticking to, you know, if I was to plan out a month in advance, I would I just couldn't stick to it. I could stick to maybe general themes, but I'm just finding that that as time goes on, I'm just. I, I'm I'm not when I I'm sure you have this when you look back at your preseason plans. I can look back eight years ago and I look at it and it was much it was much more planned out than mine is now in the sense of I actually carried out everything I put down in preseason. Now it depends. It depends how are they doing and and in the middle of an exercise I might say to myself, you know what, we're not doing the rest you know, of what I planned out today because we need something else and I'm going to go right into it. Where in the past I was, you know, methodical and uh, uh, about sticking to a script. Yeah, and I think that's the, the healthy way to go. And I'm I'm not 100% there yet because I do, I do want to make sure that we check off some boxes of things that we need to do. But I do think there's value in being flexible in the moment. And, you know, let's say that you're running – uh, you know, it's your fourth day, fifth day of preseason, and you had this uh, really intense training session on defending, and you look at the guys and they're gassed, like they're tired yeah. and they're heavy legged, and so you have to adapt and you have to change, uh, you know, for the well being of, of your your players. And I do think Marcus, when you're flexible as a coach and and you respond in the moment, I think it really helps the players. And I would like to get to to your place sooner than later. Um, because I do think it's healthy for coaches not to feel, look, not to feel locked in 
to, to what they plan. That's great that you're planning, but you have to be flexible. And look, the, the end of the day, and, and I've said this to, to all my coaches who coach, look, if you set up a training session and it's not running the way that you want it to run, you have two choices. One, you can keep doing it and get frustrated and pissed yeah. off at the players because they're not doing it, or you can change it. Uh, yeah. Because the, if, if the students haven't learned, then the teacher hasn't taught. And that's that's an adage that I always am thoughtful yeah. about, that we are responsible at the end of the day for, for making sure that we're teaching our players what they need to know. And, and are they willing and ready to accept that kind of teaching instruction in that moment? If they're not, then you have to be adaptive. Yeah. Dean, you know, it's interesting. You said you had the strength and uh, conditioning people working with you and your program. Are, are you a big fan of weight training for, for soccer players? And, it, you know, give, give me a little insight of, you know, what is conditioning to you for soccer strength training for, for you? You know, I'm not a big fan of, of lower body strength training and power for, for our players. Uh, we're really trying to get them to be more explosive you know, off, mm -hmm. off the mark, off the first two, three steps. We do want to put some muscle mass on some of our slender players, you know, mm -hmm. smaller players. Um, I'm not, I'm, I don't believe that we want, I know I don't want to have, you know, a kid who's a, a five foot 10, 165 pound player to, as a freshman, I don't want them to come in and be a five foot 10, 185 pound player. But I don't think that 20 pounds is going to help them. However, when I have a six foot tall, 145 pound kid coming in, they need some, 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 some muscle mass on them. They're going to grow and fill out, but we want to make sure it's, it's appropriate. What you want to be careful of, we had this happen years ago, is we had a, a forward, a really good forward who scored a ton of goals in high school, like a ton of goals in high school. And he had thighs that we call him Quadzilla. Mm -hmm. Like he had these massive thighs. Um, and, and he did a lot of squatting. But what ended up happening was is that because his his thighs are his largest muscle group and his gluteus, his rear end, were so muscular, yeah. so big, that he would go out and he would sprint for 35, 40 seconds in a game chasing ball down or whatever. And he'd be gassed for two, three minutes because – the, 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 yeah, the, the, the lungs were calling on the muscles, right? They couldn't supply enough oxygen to the muscles. And so we had we had him lose going into his junior, senior year, almost 20 pounds of weight. And a lot of that was lower body because he was just too thick and too big and too muscular. And, and so you have to find the right balance. But when you really look at soccer players, they're still pretty lean, right? That, it, that you don't want them to carry too much muscle mass because it doesn't, I think it, the, the probably perfect, would be Ronaldo, you know, as a soccer player, he's, he's muscular and fit, but he's not big and massive. Like you wouldn't stand out. And so you have to strike that right balance in our strength. He's and dropped a lot of weight. Yeah. In his yeah. Age. He, he really yeah. has. I mean, in his mid twenties, he was much bigger because he was, yeah. you know, he could probably afford it a little bit, but he yeah. dropped a lot for me. I mean, I remember talking to, to, I think it was Paul Caligiri's fitness coach, and he made a good point. He said that if your upper body becomes top heavy, you could run sh in a straight line, linear, very fast, but you can't change directions because the weight of your upper body is going one way and you want to change the other way. It's like it's terrible for changing direction. So you got to keep that upper body nice and lean. And it, th that made a lot of sense to me. And you know, I used to mess around with that myself, even when I was a college player between power lifting and cross training. And I got to tell you, I, I never felt a massive benefit of of hitting the weights too hard. I, I, I in fact, it, it it impeded my flexibility up top a little bit. That's what you have to be to be thoughtful about strength without flexibility uh, is dangerous and flexibility without strength is useless, yeah. you know, as another adage. Um, but here's what I will say to you is that. Division one soccer is is 17 18 year olds playing against 22 year olds right and these 17 18 year olds are coming in that probably many of them never lifted a weight in their lives yeah. more and more are i believe that putting on some muscle mass for for the lean thin player particularly central players yeah is important for protection right how to protect your skeletal system for, for those 50 50 challenges in the air and and so you know we we tend to have more upper body injuries with our younger guys 
and lower extremity injuries because they're getting pushed around. They're just getting pushed around by 21, 22 year old men. You know, in, in, in your program, you probably have 24, 25 year old guys who are men. And, you know, when you play men against boys, the boys need to become men. And part of that is just to fill out a little bit and have the appropriate amount of muscle mass on them to protect their skeletal system. Uh, and so for me, it's just making sure that they have, they put some muscle on and they, they, they get some strength to them. Um, because look, we have one kid who every time that he was in a 50, 50 challenge and shoulder to shoulder, he lost that ball because he just got pushed off uh, and he's just too weak. You know? It's, it's funny though, Dean, right? Because it's a, it's a problem because to be, to take away the, the physical aspect, you have to be so technical and move the ball so fast that most players can't do it. So it becomes a physical battle. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and look, you and I know that you, you can neutralize that physicality by being smart and, yeah. and, and not getting into it. And a good example is when it, if you and I are shoulder to shoulder and, and, and you're faster than me and we're chasing a ball, rather than fight the upper body, all I need to do is step my leg in front of yours and, and have my first step come across your body, right? So that all you can do is foul me as opposed to just trying to race for the ball. But those little things you have to teach players as well. And and so I think you have to find a balance with with strength and conditioning. I do think the explosiveness uh, is important. I, I And where I think it's most valuable is for our goalkeepers. You know, I think mm -hmm. our goalkeepers getting that explosiveness and having some upper body shoulder strength and hand strength and, and arm forearm strength is important for them when managing ball and coming out in the crowd. Yeah, it's, it's funny. When you look at Xavi and Iniesta and stuff, obviously, you know, these are little skinny guys, but they move the ball. I mean, that's the top players in the world. Yeah. And I think you could even look at the MLS, right? And and for me, even the U.S. national team right now, I, I attribute a lot of their success. Physically, we're really good at center mid right now with Tyler Adams and McKenzie, and we have the, the kid who plays for Valencia. I forgot his name. I think he's a Ghanaian kid. Yeah. I mean – it's very powerful. We're very powerful there. And when I look at the MLS, the teams with a $25 million salary cap get good enough players to move the ball. But the teams that are spending 4 or $5 million as their total payroll, they can't move the ball like that, and it becomes physical. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it, yeah. so for me, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult. This brings me out, you know, I want to ask you a question about that where – you know, we have Caleb Porter and we had Bruce Arena, who were both college coaches who who go to the MLS. And I think that both those guys won the MLS Cup and their record speech speaks for themselves. What's your opinion about like for me and when I look at college soccer, there are some fantastic coaches who run incredible programs and it's high level soccer. Do you think that it's a little unfortunate that the MLS doesn't look at our college coaches more seriously? compared to just sometimes just promoting guys who have no coaching experience and just putting them as a head coach. Like what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I have some thoughts on that. And, and, and we can't, we cannot overlook Ziggy Schmidt, who was at yeah. UCLA, yeah. Bob Bradley, who was at Princeton. Yeah. Princeton, uh, you're right. Princeton. Yeah. You, you look at, you go look at the historically at, at some of the winningest coaches in the MLS uh, and the top, the top half of that are going to be college coaches uh, that went into the MLS, and and I believe there's a really a reason for that. I think that that when college coaches are are like yourself and me, like we don't we show up and work at at seven thirty eight in the morning, uh, and we plan all day and work all day. We know how to do the administrative side of it. We know how to look at you know all the technology that's out there. We know how to organize. We know how to communicate. We know how to teach because we've been doing it and we know how to relate with people in, 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 in our offices and in our organization, because we're constantly on committees and all that. And then you step into a professional organization. It's not, it's not challenging for them because they've been doing it all their lives. This level of, of, of organization and planning and having a system in place and, and candidly, and with all due respect to, to coaches who finish their playing career and immediately become a coach, um, or coaches who come over from overseas. And I've had this debate with, with people in front offices in the MLS mm -hmm. is that I don't understand why you would hire a guy that's only had five years of coaching and who's never shown any success other than playing success over a college coach who's shown consistent success. And, and I think, yeah, it's disappointing to me that, that in our sport of soccer, that somebody who is, you know, a 30, 
23 year old just finished his playing career is inserted in to be a head coach and rarely are they successful rarely do you see them them last because it's it, it took me 10 years yeah 15 years to, to get to the level i am and understand the game i way to understand how to relate to people and how to talk to people and 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 i oh that's the other thing too is i think college coaches know how to relate to players they know how to yeah. talk to players because yeah. we're obligated to a lot of the international coaches that that i know and that have struggled in in the mls because they don't know how to relate to players they just expect them to be pros show up and play right and that's your yeah. job go play and yeah. and so yeah I, I i'm i'm shocked that the mls isn't more aware of of the the history of college coaches coming in and having an impact in the league and being successful in the league and and they're going to continue to do that and they'd be foolish not to look at you know some of the top college coaches anytime that there's a job opening because yes. i guarantee you that that they're going to be successful at the next level. it's mind-boggling to me because like the nfl will pick up some of the best college coaches like other you know, even the nba from time to time like it, it, I just don't understand it. And I think that soccer is one of the only, I don't know, it's one of the only sports where there's a licensing system. And I really think like they get caught up on, hey, I got this license and I worked at this pro club for two years. But does a license replace 30 years of coaching at a, at a Division One college? I mean, come on. Like, I, I, I think that's crazy to me. It doesn't, yeah, it is crazy. And, and the other thing too, Marcus, that is disappointing to me is that the sport of soccer has morphed into this notion that young is better than yeah. older and wiser, right? Yeah. Let's let's hire a young coach that you know looks the part mm -hmm. uh, and 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 puts on the presentation mm -hmm. over a coach who's in his sixties, who's very wise, who's been through it all, and and understands what needs needs to get done. Where in football, and basketball, and baseball, they still value wisdom. They still value experience, right? And yeah. and I bet you the average age of the head coaches in those sports um, are much higher than the average age of MLS coaches. Now, European coaches, I still think, and international coaches, they value wisdom and age and experience. Um, but certainly in our country, young is young is always seems to be better. And I think that's that's a big mistake that MLS front offices are making. It's also weird to me that. You know the same coaches, and we could even say EPL and whatever. It's the same coaches. Like somebody loses the job, who's the next guy? Oh, it's it's no one new. And then yeah. you even have yeah. like yeah. a divide between if you coached at Wigan Athletic, you might be able to coach at Stoke City or somewhere up, but you're not coaching for Man United. There's a divide there. There's only a certain amount of people that are ever allowed to be considered for a top six job compared to working with the bottom teams. You know, if you're Tony Poulos, you're, you're, you're getting categorized as you know how to organize a team. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting right. to me. Um, yeah, very interesting. And I, I do think too that there's an educational divide and I'm gonna go back to international coaches um, um, who've come over here and, and some have had success and done well, but many haven't. When I was, my first coaching course in England, the FA prelim badge, Mm -hmm. No, it was all it was two Americans, three Americans, and the rest were international coaches. Most of these coaches had far more better playing experience than I had. Yeah. You know, coached at a much higher level than I had. And candidly, I went over there. My, I was a high school teacher or coach. Mm -hmm. I was then a varsity coach and teaching high school. But what I found really interesting is, is that while they knew more about soccer and more about tactics and were better players than I ever would ever be and were around really good players, they were really poor in terms of organizing and planning practices. And by the end of the first week, when when we were getting into our coaching, because we coached, we had to do four or five sessions. You know, it was a three week course. I'm like a U.S. where you get one 15 minute coaching session, they evaluate you. You you got almost a full practice. I had probably 15 to 20 international coaches lined up outside my door every night because they didn't know how to write a practice plan. And then the English FA wanted them to, to write a practice plan and submit it. They had no idea how to write a practice plan. And so so that that made me realize, and this was many years ago, that they're not being, they haven't been introduced to the notion of practice plan and, and development and progressions and all mm -hmm. that. Um, and if the, good for them for being there. And I, I know their, their FA association sent them there. And we're talking about coaches from you know Africa and from Europe and other places. 
is like that they just didn't know what they didn't know. And so I do think that there's still a divide educationally with some of the international coaches who come over here and don't understand the structure and, and of, of what it's like to coach in America and, and how players react to organization and planning and, pro, and process and all that. And so yeah. that opened my eyes a great deal. Yeah. Dean, I want to ask you just a club ball. Like, so you also coach club ball. How, how, um, and this kind of leads into a question about, we talked about, you know, I know you guys, you, you want your players to compete every day. They have to have this huge work ethic. I get all those fundamental things. When I teach, like my son is seven. So when I go and spend time with him and his U8 team, I mean, it is so fun. And there's that night, there's that innocence. And it's just, it's just amazing. The kids are there just because they're enjoying it. Is there a certain part at Lehigh though that you really do want the kids to have fun too? Like how, like, and do you intentionally try to create that? And can you tell me a little bit about like how it's is club ball for you? Does that have that same kind of influence for you? Yes. Um, look, I, I coach club soccer. I retired last year from I think probably for the better part of 10 years in this area but I started coaching club soccer back in the 80s with Medford Strikers so I've been around the club game for four or five decades um, I do think that the club experience the youth soccer experience I'll, I'll put it that way needs to be about enjoyment and and inspiring kids to enjoy it and one of my worries about starting kids too soon Marcus is is that there it becomes too serious. If you don't have the right coaches working with the right kids at the right age groups, 75% of our kids are quitting youth sports in our country by the age of 14. Mm -hmm. and, and that's because they're having bad experiences between the ages of seven and 14 because coaches are taking it too seriously um, and are too concerned about winning, not concerned enough about development, inspiration, fun, enjoyment, all the things that really matter with a young kid. And in fact, I have four boys, three of them played at Lehigh, I didn't put them in organized sports till they were 10. Um, I just was like, go play in the backyard, go play in the basement, go play with your friends. Like go play pickup. Like I don't, you don't, you don't, you don't need an adult to structure you. Go own. And it was the right decision because having been in the youth sector, what I discovered is that there, there are two factors that will influence a kid's longevity in a sport, pick any sport. It is coaching and parents. Mm. Uh, most parents are unrealistic about, about what what kids should be learning and doing at the ages of eight, nine, and ten, they think that the kids should be getting trophies and and winning games, right, and having ribbons and all that. And if they don't, that they're going to lose their minds. Um, and and coaches get sucked. Parent coaches get sucked into that. They think, wow, uh, you know, I, if this this U nine team doesn't win this game, I I'm not going to have a job. And so, so when people ask me when when is winning important for any athlete. I say when a coach's mortgage is dependent upon it and a player's salary is dependent upon it, right? Livelihood is dependent upon it. Otherwise, it's not important. And so, yeah, I even at even at the division one level where results matter, you know, I, I can't I can't go three seasons and not have success because I won't have a job. Um, I've been on 31 year contracts here at Lehigh. And so I know that that results matter. Yet we didn't we didn't because we were struggling with culture the day before we played army um uh we were zero and three at that point in the league i had the team over my house we didn't even practice we didn't go out to practice the day before a game and all we did was play competitive games in teams of five pick up you know basketball mm -hmm. you know shooting uh disc golf uh, i had them do uh, mm -hmm. uh, brain teasers competitive but it was, had nothing to do with a soccer ball you know uh can jam you name it it was just a, an entirely different experience for them, but they they needed to, to be boys. They needed to compete. They needed to be away from soccer. And the more we can allow our players, and I coach on the men's side, so I'll use this term, allow them to be boys and allow them to play and allow them to to just enjoy not the beauty of the game of soccer, but the, the, the privilege of being a, a college athlete and having all these things at their disposal, including a full-time coaching staff in these fields and equipment, but let them go play pickup football or, or, you know, soccer kickball or you name it. Like I, I will do tag games with our players 
once or twice a week, um, yeah. just because they're boys. They need to be boys. And so I'm a division one coach where my livelihood depends upon it. And I will give up, gladly give up portions of practice to, to let them be boys. Uh, that's awesome. Something unrelated to soccer. Yeah. For me, that's, that's, that's massively, massively important. And I, I, I think yeah. that, um, well, when it comes to youth soccer, for me, representative game design, it's got to be soccer. It can't be, hey, we're going to drill these kids to these cones. And the kids get bored. They want to play the game. And that's one of the things that I always look for in youth soccer. And it's it, it's funny, like, when you go to, you know, the season in division, you know, in college soccer is a grind, especially in postseason and all this. So people don't realize the mental fatigue that goes on. And I think that enjoyment part and doing things like you're talking about really helps kids to alleviate, you know, that grind and it helps them relax. And I, I think that's a really important part because, you know, high winds don't blow all day. If you're always super intense, you're going to burn yourself out. you you got to have uh -huh. fun and relax. And yeah, ultimately, yeah. we all play this game because it's a kid's game, you know. And as soon as you take enjoyment out of it, I, you know, it's it, it's it's no good. But, you know, if I think about this, Dean, like there's probably not a day that goes by in your life that you don't think about soccer. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And yeah. and that shows that, you know, guys like, you know, guys like you and guys like me, we're passionate about the game and it's given us so much joy. It's, you know, it, it, we're privileged, obviously, to work in this profession. It's, yeah, we are. And and I want to go back to what, you know, the, the whole the youth soccer experience and you're right about the enjoyment part of it unfortunately we're raising an era of of youth athletes that and this has happened over the last two decades and this is one of the things that i i speak to a lot about is that because they've never had free play or play without oversight or instruction they lack they lack some skill sets that are really important so when you and i grew up I, I guarantee you that, that you've played pickup and everything, pick up football, pick up, uh, uh, you know, street hockey, you know, mm -hmm. uh, stick ball, whatever. We picked our own teams. We made our own rules. We explored different ways of dribbling a ball, running with the football. So you didn't get tackled in the cement or a tree that was nearby. Right. Uh, you know, knowing how to, to, to step off a curb when you're playing stickball without rolling your ankle. Like there are all these these ways that we had to be creative. But we also developed leadership skills, like the whole empathy the skill set. Like when kids get injured today mm -hmm. in a youth game, everybody takes a knee. I don't get that. Like, why are we taking a knee? You know, when our, when when a kid got hurt, when we were playing kickball out in the street and the kid fell down and had a bloody knee and you know, we ran over, everybody ran over like, okay, because we didn't yes. want it was selfish. We didn't want to lose him, right? We wanted him to play. We didn't want him to run home. And so like threw dirt on it. We made sure he's okay. Yeah, you're fine. You get him play. But, you know, between the leadership skills, the problem solving skills, the conflict resolution, look, when our players get into a, a, a get pissed at one another, they, they, they want to hit each other. You know, they want to throw a punch. When we were kids, we were like, hey, get over it. Let's go. Let's play. And so... We have a generation of kids who are losing really important skill sets because there's just too much oversight too soon. Uh, and and when my message, messaging to my four sons and my wife's messaging to them is that whenever there was a conflict, if they came running to us to solve it, we were the government. We would solve it. And we would solve it by saying, all right, you're done playing. Go to your rooms uh, <laughs> and we'll talk later. And And after four or five times of them not being able to go back and play, or do what they were doing because they had to go to the rooms. They were like, "Don't involve the government. Like, let's 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 do our own thing and let's figure it all out, right?" And and yeah. so we want to raise kids that you want to raise kids. You can prepare the path for your kid, or you can prepare your kid for the path. And and we try to raise kids. I try to raise our kids that we prepared them for the path, and they can make their own choices. And my message in the youth coaches is. Don't overthink it. Don't overdo it. If you're going to focus on anything, Marcus, and if you're a youth coach and you know this, is let them play as much as they can. Let them go to goal, even at small goals, without any, without any goalkeepers, and just all the thing beat on them. Receive foot, like get those kids down. And if you do that, uh, I'll be so thankful that I don't have to try to break kids of bad habits because they don't know how to receive a ball or pass a ball uh, with the inside yeah. of the foot. 
Yeah. No, no. I, it, it's all that stuff. It's it's so important. It's funny because even our college players and like the first thing a kid does when they come to soccer practice, they look for instruction. Where do I line up? Coach mm -hmm. is going to take us through the warm up. Coach takes us through the drills. Coach take. You know, when we when we travel with them, we tell them what room they sleep in. We tell them what time to meet us in the lobby. We tell them where we're going to eat. Their job is just to be a robot. And that's not good. And you're right. Unstructured play is massively important. Can the kids show up at the field and start to organize their own three on three game without me having to say anything? And then, you know, I, I, I'm in I'm in big favor of it's funny. I was talking to one organization who runs a lot of the soccer coaching staff so all around you know for youth coaches around new england and they don't want to do play you know let the kids play in the beginning because um it makes it look like they're not doing their job and they shouldn't be paid if they're not doing their job and because they're not giving instruction and i'm like no nah, let the kids play like let them play for the first 15 20 minutes and then uh that that's that's just that's just my thing like because i i i my one question i never speak to i don't know how how you do it with your kids when they were growing up but i never spoke to speak to my son about what he did right or wrong in practice i my first question is did you have fun today and the the first second he ever says no this sucks you know i'm gonna be like all right well maybe maybe, maybe so we gotta do something else but but I'll ask him now because he's like me. I never wanted to listen to my dad that much about sports. So I said, let me know when you want one or two tips and I'll give them to you. And then it's up to him. And then he'll come back a day later and says, all right, give me one. <laughs> and, that, and that's our relationship about soccer. Well, it, 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 it's hard. It's really hard when you're a coach and a parent. Yeah. And, and of your kid, right? And so, and I think you're right. I think, I think you, you don't want to impose the coach on your kid, particularly when they're at home. And so I've always said to my kids, listen, when I'm at practice, I'm your coach. Uh, when I'm in the car, I'm your dad. And when I'm at home, I'm your dad. If you want information or anything, thoughts, my feedback, ask. If you don't, I'm not giving it to you. Like, I'm not going to, I'm going to do the same thing. Did you have fun? Did you enjoy the experience? Um, did you learn anything? But I, I don't want to go home and coach my kids, you know. And now when they got older and they were interested in tactics, we always had a whiteboard in our kitchen, you know, and they would ask a question. I'd be like, okay, so here's a situation, you know, that happened in the game. And I would draw it up on there. What would you do differently in that? They liked that because they yeah. were older enough to process that. But when they were younger, I, I just, look, I want to be your dad at home. Like, don't let's, let's not talk soccer because look, I, I live it and breathe it and you live it and breathe it yeah. and, and let them, let them initiate all that. And, and so for any parent coach who's listening, you know, you know, you have to draw that line in the sand and be very clear because otherwise it confuses the kid when when you're being both parent and both coach all the time. And that's hard on them. You know, it's funny, Dean. It's like now, you know, the technology now, like my kid found a soccer show on YouTube and it's a cartoon. And I, you know, I didn't, you know, when he found it on his own. And now, like, this show is so funny that, like, they literally go through tactics and, like, that's how the team wins. And so I'm sitting on the couch and once I'll be like, they're like, Dad, you need a taller striker because you need somebody who's an aerial threat when the ball's crossed. I'm like, I'm like, dude, where did you learn that? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I, I know it's it. coming from that cartoon. I love it. It's that's so awesome. funny. But, but mean, again, from, he's doing that on his own, right? He's watching it on his own, and that's what you want. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's funny. I mean, dude, like I used to skip. I used to lie to my mom and say I was going to ch to church, and um. We used to go watch soccer made in Germany on public TV on Sundays. And that was the only bit of soccer I ever got to see in the eighties. Right. And then I would eventually watch the Italian league when it came on and v and put it on a VHS and then rewind the tape and try to analyze the footwork. And, but now information is accessible. It's at anyone's fingertips. It's really, yep. you know, what, what's your, what's your thought on in a, in a, in a, in a club situation, do you spend a lot of time on technique or do you spend more time on decision making? You know, s since I've gotten to know you, you've influenced me incredibly on the decision making piece and, and trying to put your your athletes in 
in decision. So you, to your point, you know, when you do a passing exercise, it's linear and they're following their past or they're moving in the other direction. There's really no decisions to be made. And so no. the more decisions that you can have your players make in a training environment that relate to the game, uh, the quicker they're going to develop. If, if you're just putting them in lines and passing and you're just doing pattern training that does, it's just following a pattern, there might be some value in that, but it's not enduring. Um, yeah. And so I do think technical... I do think technical mastery is important, but so much of that has to be done on their own. They have to have the passion to do that on their own. And, and you know, I, I remember years ago, I had a, a, a kid on my team, Jesse Schramm, who was by far the most technical player I've ever, ever coached. Um, I still see him. We're still on Facebook and he's in his mid thirties and he's still doing uh, videos of him technically. And it's amazing, you know, at his age, but his coach, his club coach told me that one year that he was, I guess Jesse was 14 or 15. He's out of New Hampshire. They're in indoor soccer. The practice was almost over. Jesse was off in the, in the corner juggling a ball by himself. Um, and the coach was like, hey, Jesse, the coach was giving right home. We're leaving in about five minutes. I was like, okay. And he's a very quiet kid, very respectful. Five and the coach was like, Jesse's never like this. He's always – like very respectful and responsive. And mm -hmm. so the coach grabbed the balls, the bag of balls and walked out to his car without Jesse and waited in his car. And about six minutes later, Jesse came in and said, all sweaty. And said, like, coach, I'm so sorry. Now this Jesse actually was 14. Mm -hmm. And the coach is like, well, what, what were you doing? Like, it's not like you because I was breaking my record of juggling. I, I juggled <laughs> the ball. And the coach was like, well, how many did you do? And he said, that was 5,000. Right? <laughs> so so 5,000 juggles. Now, now you and I both know that, that being a master juggler doesn't make you a good soccer player right that right. but but what it made him was and he was a really good soccer player because see the other parts came with it you know the tactical yes. understanding and whatever but he was never uncomfortable with the ball like it, yeah. he rarely ever lost the ball and if we had the kind of stats we have today on keeping track of possession he would be like a javi at yeah. our level just never lost the ball and i do think that technical mastery is important but that's got to be time on their own uh yeah. and 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 then they have to have the inspiration to do that but i think yeah this is putting kids in training sessions where they're making as many decisions as they possibly or as they can is really important. yeah yeah I, i'm yeah that's that's a major thing for me because i you know there's a story about the the african guy who won the olympics in the javelin and he there was no javelin coach he, he got all his instruction from videos from youtube from a guy in sweden mm -hmm. and he won the yeah. olympic gold medal and that yeah. just shows you that technically you can figure things out and you, but you have yeah. to have the motivation and you have to find the motivation. You know, How many yeah. times do you think that, uh, Michael Fapp Phelps ran laps around the, uh, around the pool, you know, uh, running, he did, he, he got in the pool and he swam, right? He doesn't, you don't become a great swimmer by just running outside the pool and going for runs mm -hmm. and jogs. You, you, you become a great world-class swimmer by spending time in the water. Yeah. Yeah. And that, the nice thing about soccer is, maybe unlike swimming well i shouldn't say that is there's a lot of flexibility for a lot of different body types and a lot of you know you know you can you don't have to be just one thing and you got to figure out like what you're really good at and and how can you fit in and you know reach the level you want to reach so i always kind of yeah. like that about soccer it's kind yeah, of yeah and, and only my own exception to that and this is again to all youth coaches when you have uh, a nine ten year old uh short kid who's overweight and and his parents are five foot five each don't put him in goal and don't train him to be goalkeeper because you know get that kid out running around uh, yeah he'll eventually thin out yeah uh, and he'll eventually become a good soccer player but if you look at the parents in a five foot five and because this kid is a little bit overweight don't make this yeah. something that that's the only place he can play yeah. let him play out in the field and let him let him let him run around because he's never going to make it as a five foot five goalkeeper yeah, yeah. Uh, totally later on Dean, listen, we, we've been going at this a little while now, so um, I really appreciate the time that, that you gave us today, and it, it was it was great to, to get some insight into you and your program, and I'll, I'll probably be in touch soon. Dean, I don't know if you're going to the convention, might see you there. If not, I definitely want to come down this spring um, and, and observe your program a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, look, I'd, I'd love to connect with you. I will be at the convention, and we should connect there. I hope that we can find time
before that just have some conversations but you know you're always welcome if you need to get away and i know you like it in in this area here and there's always a lot to do so um if you need to escape and get down here you're coming down here to recruit you know um please please let me know we'd love to, to spend some time with you appreciate it dean thanks so much